study about children's use and experience of urban neighbourhoods, Auckland urban neighbourhoods, ranging from um, the inner city where apartment living is, is relatively common through to children living in suburban low density environments. It's also a study about physical activity and independent mobility. And by independent mo we, mobility, we mean um, outdoor play and uh, active travel, walking, scootering, cycling to school or shops without the constant supervision of adults. Now we know from, oh, we know from um, studies with adults that neighbourhoods are, are important for levels of physical activity. In a study that we worked on a couple of years ago, the urban study in Auckland, Christchurch and Wellington, um, we found that um, for adults, both their physical activity for recreation and for transport was much higher when they lived in compact environments in higher density areas than in lower density areas. But um, what, about, what about children? That, it's far less clear. And this is quite an important question when you consider that uh, most of our larger cities have got aspirations to try to slow the rate of greenfield growth on the city fringes and try to accommodate an increasing population uh, in more intensive urban environments. So what, how will children fare? And what can we learn from children about how we can create high density environments that meet their needs for, particularly for play space and safe travel? These are a couple of examples of what are probably the better examples of um, uh, higher density developments in Auckland, Hobson Hall Point at the top and Addison at the bottom. Um, Robin and I uh, took a number of um, European urban researchers on a field trip around Auckland uh, a wee while ago, and they were bemused to think that we consider this to be a higher density environment, you know, <laughs> given the apartment living which is the norm in most um, European cities. So, um, Robin and I, um, I'll, I'll begin by giving you an idea of, of the study and how we um, undertook the study and some of the diversity of children's experiences in these different types of neighbourhoods. And then Robin will pick up and talk about children's use of a, or experience with a particular inner city urban environment, Crane Cathy Road. Um, and then Robin will pull it together with a few of our conclusions from the study. But in terms of the starting point for kids in the city, we had a number of starting points. First off, that neighbourhoods matter, that they're more than just the backdrop of children's lives. They are the environments in which they either have or do not have opportunities for outdoor play. They either do or don't have safe routes for getting between places. Um, it's also in the context of children's declining physical activity and independent mobility in New Zealand over the last couple of decades. Um, some of you may know the, uh, the, the results of the New Zealand Transport Survey in terms of active travel to school, that are, over the past 20 years the mean number of minutes per week that children are involved in active travel has dropped from 130 minutes per week to down to 69 minutes per week. And over the same period, the proportion of children who have been transported to school, usually by car, has gone from 31 to 59 per cent. Um, and independent mobility, uh, or being out and about, for many children has become an adult-dependent activity now. So that means that children are reliant on those windows of opportunity when parent, busy parents are available, where they can take children out and monitor their behaviour out of doors. Um, we're also, one of our starting points is that independent mobility um, is important. It's important for children's development, and not just for their physical development, but also for their cognitive and their environmental understanding and their social, social development. Because as kids negotiate um, and navigate around their neighbourhood, they're learning um, you know, the, the proximity of places to place, so they understand their environment. They also get to um, interact with um, people and that gives them social skills. And the kids that are out and about more, there's pretty strong evidence that those children have um, more friendships as well as um, better environmental understanding. And finally, kids have a right to play and that they have a right to a voice in planning decisions that impact on their lives. So that's sort of the background to our study. And in Auckland, um, we now have children living in all types of dwellings, from inner city apartments to medium density to um, traditional detached um, houses. So to make sure that uh, we included children in our study that lived in all those different dwelling types, we recruited children through schools 
and we selected um, three schools in the inner city where apartment living is relatively common and other, um, the other six schools were in suburban areas of different um, socioeconomic um, decile rating and also of different um, urban design attributes. So what we did, we went out to the schools and we met with the children and we taught them about GPS. And we gave them a watch so that they could zip in and out and see how many satellites they could uh, identify when they were inside buildings, under trees and in, in playing fields, just to engage them with the study. And that those children that then were wanted to take part and whose parents gave them permission, they then wore a GPS and an accelerometer for seven days. The GPS to track where they moved around their neighbourhood and the accelerometer to so that we could um, measure the amount of physical activity they were doing in different places as they moved about. We also uh, had to ask the children to f fill out a trip diary, a, a, like a travel diary. Um, we gave them all a little plastic watch because kids tend not to wear watches anymore. And so on down here you'll see the children made a note of where they went, the time they went, how they went, whether they went by bike, scooter, board, bus, etc. and who they went with. Um, whether they were on their own, um, with a parent, adult, with friends or with siblings. We were trying to understand children's mobility on their own and how the different modes that they used for travel. And um, we went to the, to the school every day and met with the children because, um, and checked their travel diaries to make sure that we were collecting very good quality data just to remind children to go through their day um, to make sure that we, at times we picked up additional trips that they had missed and also to recharge their GPS units. Uh, the children also took part in go-along neighbourhood walking interviews. And these were when a, uh, either a local teenager who had trained in interview techniques or one of the researchers went on a child-led inter interview, walking interview with the children. And the idea was we framed it as the children being neighbourhood reporters. And so they were telling us about the places they liked, they didn't like, places they were allowed to go on their own, places they um, were able to go um, only with their parents, etc. Places they'd like to go if they could on their own, but they weren't allowed. That sort of, that sort of thing. Um, we also interviewed um, all of their parents by telephone, and we were particularly interested in interviewing parents about their neighbourhood perceptions, perceptions of neighbourhood safety, neighbourhood cohesiveness, the social relationships that they had with people within their neighbourhood. And also, um, whether or not they thought it was okay for their children to go alone to a range of different destinations, like shops and parks and friends' places, because we thought that these might be factors that impacted on whether or not the children were out and about or not. So what we found, um, we're going to mostly um, talk about children's data, children's experiences uh, today, but it's really important to note that because of the gatekeeper role that parents play, in children's um, access to um, the wider world, that in all the statistical modelling that we've done of the, re the relationship between children's independent trips, um, the, the strongest predictor of whether children are out and about is parents' views. Parents' views of neighbourhood safety, but in particular parents' views of what is the appropriate age for children to be um, able to go on their own to different types of destinations. Um, children in our study lived enormously diverse lives. We had children who had never been outside of their apartment front door or their front gate uh, without the accompaniment of an adult. And many of these children didn't have a lot um, of knowledge of their um, neighbourhood. And so when they were going on the child leave neighbourhood interviews, there weren't many places that they liked or didn't like or that, that they could take um, the interviewers um, to. But we had other children that uh, were very free roaming. Um, they had scooter or travel, they knew every nook and cranny of their local neighbourhood, they knew every shortcut. And some of these children had quite deep personal histories and stories to tell about particular trees, particular houses, particular um, spots in their, um, in their neighbourhood. Um, as we walked around, we also asked the children what it would mean to have an adventure. And for um, a number of these children, to have an adventure wasn't something which happened outside. It was a virtual experience. It was something that they did on the, on the computer. Um, now, 
I'm going to um, give you a bit of an understanding of what kids liked and what they disliked at a very general level, and then um, some information on the sorts of places that children go and uh, the sorts of trips which give them the opportunities, uh, the greatest opportunities to be independent. So with, with uh, the children in the study, and there were 250 children, and they were 9 to 12 years. I should have told you that at the beginning, um, to give you a sense of their age. Um, they liked, uh, the kids mostly liked where they lived, um, even if they didn't like everything about where they lived. And uh, it's very similar to studies elsewhere, internationally. Children like to have friends close by, they like to have places to play, they like to be close to amenities, particularly amenities like um, parks and schools and shops. They also like quiet and peaceful places, and they also like school. Um, many of the children took their interviewer to their school and showed them the places they played at their school. Um, and most, there were several schools in our um, study that were closed after hours to um, children, um, but most of them were open. Um, and what children dislike, um, on the whole children dislike uh, things or people which make them feel uncomfortable or unsafe. Um, and dangerous traffic is mentioned in all areas from the inner city to the suburban. Uh, <coughs> children are very aware of, of what they call freaky, weird, or, or um, odd people. Um, and in the inner city, this would um, often be people who were um, homeless or perhaps had mental illness, or particularly people who were intoxicated. Um, but in the suburban areas, it was more likely to be uh, youth, particularly in parks. And again, drinking was, was critical to children feeling unsafe. And the children were particularly concerned in the suburban areas about being bullied and um, mocked by older children. In the suburban areas, dogs were a fear, rubbish and graffiti, um, and uh, children were particularly uh, concerned at rubbish and, and graffiti when they were in areas that they considered to be theirs, like playgrounds. Um, noise, both traffic noise and the noise of people um, partying, kids were sensitive to noise. They, they also didn't like not being allowed to make noise. And this was really an issue for a number of children in the apartments, when neighbours in the apartments had complained about their noise. Uh, or if they were out scootering and laughing and they were people complained about the noise they made there. From the um, trip diary data, we collected over 7,000 information on over 7,000 trips that the children had undertaken. And <coughs> children go everywhere. So to try to make sense out of these 7,000 um, trips, we had to develop a typology of trip purposes and trip destinations. Um, and to give you a sense of the um, diversity of uh, the types of trips and the independence of trips children living in different areas um, take, we've um, divvied up the trips um, the, in terms of the uh, numbers of trips that children take uh, for those that went to schools in the inner city, in the suburban mid-decile areas and in the um, low-decile um, schools. So you'll see here, kids go to school. <laughs> um, and they mostly go to school five days a week. Um, on the vertical axis, that's the mean number of trips per week. Um, and on the horizontal is, uh, as I said, divided into inner city, suburban mid-decile and suburban low-decile school. So the point to note here is the thatched area on the lower part of the graph are the proportion of the trips that children made independently. So children in the low decile schools, almost half um, of their trips to school were made independently without the constant supervision of adults, whereas in the um, mid socioeconomic area, they were only about a quarter of the trips were made independently. The second most common trips, trips that children made were trips to shops. Uh, and children in the, in the suburban low decile area made almost as many trips to the shop over a week as they made to, uh, made to school. And about a third of these trips were um, made independently. And you'll see again the children in the um, mid socioeconomic um, suburban area, very few, only about 8% of their trips to, to, to the shops were made independently. Um, and quite striking differences um, when we now look at um, physical activity related to sports and more informal physical activity. So when, um, by sports we mean physical activity events like going to a club, going to a practice, going to a game. 
um, and the children in the inner city, uh, they had on, on, on average two such trips per week. Whereas children in the low, um, low decile suburban area had um, the equivalent of half a trip per week. And the um, suburban mid decile children somewhere in between. And very few of these trips were independent trips. The children tend to be taken by car to these types of sporting events and taken by car back. Um, quite a different picture when you look at informal play. And informal play were trips to the park and street based play. And for these, the um, lower decile suburban children had um, the, on average two of these trips per week. And a very high proportion of these trips were independent. Um, the, you, you, can, you can see really, I don't need to repeat myself there, but um, striking difference in terms of formal and informal play opportunities between the high socioeconomic and the low socioeconomic groups. So the types of trips which gave children the greatest opportunity to be um, independent were trips to school, uh, trips for informal play, and also trips to um, friends' places. I didn't present that information. Um, because we were interested in physical activity and independent mobility, we were mostly interested in the trips children made away from home. But actually, for almost all of the children, their favourite place to play was home. And for children in suburban areas, that would include backyards and, and driveways. For children in the, in the um, high-rise apartment blocks, their home-based play was almost exclusively sedentary and it involved um, you know, a lot of um, tablet, computer, TV type entertainment as well as books and board games. Um, electronic um, uh, games was also pretty popular in the suburban areas. It was just that they had other alternatives as well. Um, some of you may be aware of uh, the, the theorising by um, Oldenburg around third places. Third places being as distinct from um, first place being home and second place being work or for children's school. And third place has been those other sorts of community environments which allow for social interaction. Places like parks and libraries and community centres and sports clubs. Well, these, and, and um, we're going to talk about three different types of third places, destination third places, threshold third places, and transitory third places. So for children, um, Oldenburg's theorising has, has largely been around um, adults, but these third place destinations are uh, just as important for children, and these are some of the photographs that the children took as they were out on their go-along walking interviews. Um, similar places, cafes, parks, are important for children, but so are libraries and churches. Um, and uh, from a planning perspective, uh, children tend to be relegated to playgrounds and skate parks and perhaps libraries. You know, we, we tend not to embrace children's presence in the public realm citywide. Um, I think that's beginning to change, and Robin will give some images of where we see the beginnings of those changes in Auckland. But um, destination places are not the only type of place that's important to children's uh, play environments and their independent mobility. Threshold spaces, these are these semi-private spaces that straddle between the front door of the house and the street. So in suburban areas that might be um, driveways or the street verge or the street trees, these provide lots of play opportunities for children. Children living in apartment um, blocks, medium density and higher density, have different types of threshold spaces, but these are still very important um, play spaces for children. Um, these children uh, lived in a um, medium density block, and as you'll see, the, the girl um, used this car park here, they used it after, after five o'clock when the workers went home and during the weekends the car park became the playground for the children. My favourite place would be by the car park, would be the car park, you know, that wall. It's really big and the tennis balls don't go over it. Um, these are some other photos taken by one of the children. Um, she had used the apartment um, stairwells and corridors to play tag and hide and seek um, with her friends until the notice went up on the far side, please do not play in common areas. And her comment was, I'm over apartments, 
You can't play inside, they're too small, and now there's nowhere to play outside. We used to play hide and seek and tag in the corridor, but then the manager had calls complaining about the noise. But we were so quiet. Now there are signs on each floor. It kind of feels bad because there's nowhere to have fun. There were other um, medium density uh, in, uh, environments that the children lived in in our study. Um, uh, we had a number of children who lived in this particular environment, which was a um, social housing block developed in the 1960s by Auckland City. Um, and this provided, it's quite high density in that it's 57 dwellings per hectare, for about four storey apartments and um, units. And the children had many, many places to play in this um, block between the um, housing. There were lots of grass areas for ball, there were car parks for um, playing with scooters and skateboards, there were trees to climb, there were bushes to have dens in. And for both the children and the parents, this was probably one of the most um, favoured um, dwelling environments um, that we had throughout the entire study. Um, and the third type of, of, uh, dis of um, third place, place is the transitory places, and those are the the places between places, the routes between home and school, home and park, home and shops. And I mean, we, we tend to uh, design our roads for adults and cars in New Zealand. We, we tend not to think about children and the routes that children take. The children aren't going to be able to be independent and go between home and school and home, home and park, etc., unless these t transitory places take account of their needs. But they, 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 they don't, and for both children and adults, the fear of um, traffic speed and traffic volumes um, really was a major constraint on children being able to be out and about in these transitory um, spaces. The very ordinary transitory space is the residential street, um, but we had one um, rather extraordinary transitory space that the children um, made a lot of comments on in the inner city. And this is Craig Happy Road, and at this point I'm going to hand over to Robin, and Robin's going to tell you about their um, experiences with K Road. What a kia ora. Uh, thank you. So Kuranga Happy Road is probably the most well-known <coughs> street, street name in Auckland next to uh, or following Queen Street. It's a, it's a street that has a long uh, sort of history of, of uh, sort of morphing from being quite an important retailing uh, street <clears throat> uh, in its earlier days to in more recent uh, years, probably the, the last few decades, being uh, um, a street particularly important to uh, Pacific peoples who uh, uh, moved into inner city uh, suburbs like Greylin, Ponsonby. And then more recently, it's become a street that uh, perhaps has been uh, celebrated or disdained uh, for its uh, diversity. So um, we can see that uh, uh, it's, in these sort of images, it's a street that has been one that has welcomed, I guess, uh, difference and, and uh, diversity. The, the very name Karamahapu Road uh, incorporates Karanga, welcome, calling out, and so uh, perhaps that uh, image is uh, deeply significant in the sense that it's been a, a part of the city that has been uh, rather more open to, to others than, uh, than other parts. So uh, images of the transgender community and the gay community, and, and uh, another important community uh, is, is that of uh, homeless people, and so this is a cafe has been set up explicitly for homeless people on, on K Road. And the homeless uh, seem to gravitate to K Road partly, I guess, because it's not a, it's not a location they get moved on from in uh, quite the level of frequency that they would in the very nearby uh, Queen Street retailing area. It's also a, a street that's uh, well known for the sex industry and uh, Massage parlours, strip clubs, adult shops, sex workers are all highly visible in this diverse and accepting space in, in Auckland. So it's a, it's a, it's a rich mix of uh, otherness. In fact, the, uh, the Mayor's forward to the Auckland City Plan uh, 
sort of tacitly endorsed all of this, saying it was an eclectic bohemian culture in K Road that every great city needs. So I'm uh, not too sure that all the good citizens of Auckland would necessarily um, agree with that, but I, I guess it speaks to the way that cities are about increasingly about diversity. So, so why it was Karoo particularly of, of interest to us, it sort of fell out as a particular case study in a way because uh, very close to K Road, um, along K Road, behind K Road, uh, there have been a number of apartment buildings that have uh, arisen literally in population uh, uh, recolonization of the central business district. So, so here in this rather graphic photograph that's not only graphic in its uh, uh, symbolism on the billboard above the enterprise, but also behind the graphic contrast between the, uh, the strip club, but then in the background, the apartment building. So very, very close by, a close juxtaposition between uh, residences and um, a particular uh, form of business on K Road. So this uh, intensification um, has come to K Road apartment buildings now either side of the street, behind the street, and with apartment buildings has come uh, perhaps to some an unexpected recolonization of the inner city by families. Families who would be finding other housing within Auckland beyond their means. And, uh, and so children now uh, live in the apartments behind and, and uh, treat K Road as their neighborhood. So we became very interested in some of the narratives of the children who were associated with K Road, who, for whom K Road was a transitory space, a necessary uh, routeway for them to move through, either on the way to the school or to other destinations that, was important, that were important to them. So here's one of the children who says, oh, just take away K Road, because I don't like K Road. It's really dodgy and stuff. Yeah, because there's a lot of strippers. Another one says, yeah, there's a strip club over there. One time we saw three, peaches and cream. It's disgusting. Another one like, because here's my house and there you go up the road and then there's all those yucky shops. So we can see some quite vehement sort of descriptions coming through. And then there's Dick Smith right there. And I want to go to Dick Smith to get a new controller. This is from one of the games. I have to walk right past all those shops, like right there. We didn't want to do that. So for a, a good number of the children we spoke to associated with K Road, there was a, a sense of abhorrence or disdain for the necessity of passing by uh, activities that were dissonant with their, with their worldview. The, these um, transcripts in the focus group were, were quite uh, evocative, and some of the, the children had suggestions, almost like a... Uh, a sort of a, a junior version of the NIMBY syndrome that, you know, put them in like deserted areas where not a lot of children can go. They, they, they sort of were generalising to the rest of the childhood demographic in Auckland, saying that perhaps this just wasn't appropriate. Um, the adult shops, um, they could cover up the pictures of naked people, perhaps they say. Yeah, because on one shop there's an extremely big billboard of it, and it's quite disgusting. Probably referring to the Las Vegas girl on the previous slide. Yeah, it's really disturbing. So these are uh, quite um, strong statements. So I guess this, this leads, or led us, and it, it's in a recent paper that just was published this year in Social Science and Medicine, um, a, a paper in which we grapple with the, uh, the dissonance between the sort of statements made in that um, forward to the city plan about needing to embrace the bohemian culture and as if uh, a city is for everyone, how can it be for everyone when children, for whom uh, the city ought to be uh, a, a place that includes them, that very same demographic of children find it disgusting, abhorrent, etc. So while we did encounter some of the older children who had habituated perhaps to the, the, the sense of, of uh, dissonance with the sex industry and homeless people, that there was still this sort of sense that uh, perhaps this is a, a, a rug point within the city. How do we have an inclusive city that embraces diversity and yet children's needs and, and comfort are not necessarily uh, accommodated? But in other places, of course, there is a good deal of accommodation of children uh, uh, appearing. The Winyard Quarter of Auckland is a good example. There are other examples around uh, Auckland and other cities where I guess there is a evidence of a 
what I would call an increasing sort of ludic geography, ludic being the adjective around play and that playfulness that children can experience and we can witness them uh, engaging it, it can perhaps lead us as adults to reconnect with our, our playful sides. We can see pop-up destinations appearing. On the right-hand side, uh, table tennis uh, <coughs> uh, installation in Altair Square in Auckland. On the left-hand side, Bond Street in Wellington uh, recently, where we can see a sort of a, an, an inclusiveness of non-functional playfulness that can engage children and engage us all, perhaps. Just want to finish with a, a, a little case study well beyond K Road. Uh, uh, we had the opportunity <coughs> of being hosted by a colleague who has now become a collaborator on a new project uh, in Helsinki in Finland a couple of years ago. And some of the examples that she was able to show us were quite striking in the way that uh, different uh, spaces under the third space, sort of third place category, were really working themselves out in quite uh, engaging ways. So this is a, a reclaimed train line, a train line that's no longer functional was ripped out, but of course that leaves a corridor. And that, in that corridor in Helsinki, we had the uh, witness, the uh, uh, permanent installation of table tennis tables, um, sculptures that can be climbed upon, etc. So in a way, this is an example of a former transitory space that has become a destination for children. So, um, but then, Arguably, perhaps, it's threshold spaces we need to be most uh, acutely concerned about in an intensifying city, because these are the, the neighbourhood spaces for children, and how can those perhaps be uh, most accommodating for children? So we can, we can see that um, medium density can, can work for kids and families if the streetscapes, if the transitory, if, if the threshold spaces uh, are indeed ones that keep and uh, children in mind, a plan for children. And in the examples that Karen showed you a little earlier of uh, uh, Freeman's Bay in Auckland, where there are open spaces, trees, courtyards, in and around multi-unit complexes, perhaps these begin to show some uh, potential for being more inclusive of children. Children will use street verges and street trees, and uh, perhaps uh, open spaces can also uh, be where we can have uh, crime and prevention uh, through environmental design with uh, that level of openness. But I guess as uh, children can be our teachers as, as adults and as people involved in environmental design, as in urban design, so perhaps the, the creative repurposing of car parks, foyers, communal, communal spaces out of ours perhaps can be a, a sort of a signal for the ways other parts of the city can be repurposed and reused temporally as well as spatially. So returning to Helsinki, we can see a number of um, housing developments, quite, quite well established actually, this one, uh, Tapiola, where, um, as you can see, the, 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 the forest has been retained rather than the, the sort of uh, slash and burn and cut down and then put in a housing and then wait for some time before trees grow again. Here the, the housing has been put in, in and around and within the, the, the forested area. And then, uh, let's see, I think on the next slide we have um, an example of within the, the, uh, the forest, forested courtyard almost, uh, uh, a sand pit and uh, with the children involved uh, in active play. And then in another area, a Raviranta in uh, Helsinki, we can see uh, e even though the density is much higher there, quite large apartment blocks, small courtyards, play areas, green spaces, that, that were part of the requirements of the development. Quite an enlightening to be shown areas where developers were required to put in quite novel children's playgrounds. In fact, a different design of a children's playground associated with each apartment block. So this takes us back to areas like Freeman's Bay in Auckland. And we are reminded that the uh, threshold space is important for children, because children spend more time in the neighbourhood than else, elsewhere. So those transitory spaces, uh, we, we, we can see spaces that, that uh, children's activities can be uh, uh, creative subversion for the original intent, I guess. They can do the reclaiming of the streets.
So children, I guess the key message is that children will play anywhere and everywhere as long as they feel safe and welcome. Those two words, safe and welcome, incredibly important. So elsewhere in the world, we can see images like this in uh, developing countries, these images from India, where in the absence of conscious urban design, children will still play, children will still find those spaces in which to sort of eke out a, a play area. So I guess the challenge in, in, in the intensifying city is perhaps just to be a little bit more conscious of that and recognise the way that there can be activity within very functional spaces. The problem is that the, the default is uh, <laughs> the default is the situation. Going back to the image of the children playing on their pads at home inside, I guess the the, the default really is that um, if we create uh, roadways and, and transit routes that encourage uh, speed and efficiency and functionality, then uh, children, through the fact that their parents are the ultimate sort of guides to uh, activity, will by default end up uh, losing potential for both environmental awareness and physical activity inside. So we want to finish up by uh, thanking Philippa and the, the crew of the Centre for Sustainable, Activity, uh, Sustainable Cities for the opportunity of sharing this uh, project with you and we look forward to any comments and questions that you may have. Thank you.